welcome to Linux Action News, our weekly take on Linux and the open source world. This is episode 65, recorded on August 5th, 2018. I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. Hello, Joe. It's good to be connected with you. And I have to say, I'm not yet broadcasting from a tablet, but it may be in my future. Yes, Samsung has revealed the Galaxy Tab S4, which on the face of it is a fairly unremarkable tablet. But then you realize it's got this DeX software in it, which allows you to run a proper desktop on Android, which we've seen many times before. And it seems that they're going to have yet another go at it. Right. So when you connect this S4 tab to a monitor, both the big screen and the tablet screen can be used simultaneously. Samsung had a short demo they were showing to the press. And during that, they showed opening up to 20 windows at once. You had features like split screen, drag and drop, and it essentially functioned like a windowing desktop environment on a PC. They also mentioned that users will be able to launch the deck software without being connected to a monitor. Um, so you essentially get like an Android UI on the tablet's 10.5 inch screen, which is 2560 by 1600. So it's a pretty big display. You could fit a few windows on that thing. But it wasn't long ago that we were talking about the Dex dock and being able to turn a phone into a proper Linux machine. Uh, it makes you wonder, why can't you do that on this then? And what happened to that project? So this is, to be clear, an Android desktop environment with Android applications. In the past, when we were talking about the Dex dock, that was a Linux environment that could run some Android applications. So there seems to have been a, a focus change here. And that might just simply be because you already have large companies like Adobe and Microsoft and Google themselves that are working on windowed desktop style Android applications. Maybe they just put their finger up, detected the way the wind was going and changed. Or maybe now we have yet another series of confusing brand names where Dex does not mean what we all think Dex means. What do you think, Joe? Well, yeah, this is all because of Chrome OS, isn't it? And the fact that they've added Android app support into that. And therefore, people are making these Android apps in a way that actually works in a windowed environment rather than just full screen touch. So I'm inclined to agree that they just don't really need to run proper Linux anymore. But they were kind of targeting developers, weren't they? I, I don't know. I haven't heard any more about that. Maybe they've quietly dropped it or maybe they're just working on it simultaneously. That's what I suspect, and that's why I think it's kind of confusing, is I think you're going to have Dex, which is a windowed Android environment, and you're going to have the Dex dock, which is a docking station that gives you access to a Linux development environment that co-runs on the phone. <laughs> it's very confusing, uh, and they maybe are for different markets. The one on the tablet's more for just regular end users that might be considering a laptop where this sort of solves all that, because the price of the uh, Tab S4 is going to be 650 U.S. greenbacks for the Wi-Fi version. And that's going to be starting August 10th. They will also be offering an LTE version, but it's more expensive, it's carrier limited, those kinds of things. So you think about somebody who's maybe going for the budget purchase here. Instead of buying a full-fledged Windows 10 laptop, they go for a Galaxy Tab S4 running Android that now supports windowed applications. That might be the market. It's confusing, and I am disappointed that it's not full Linux, but I think I can see the market they're shooting for here. I don't know why that market wouldn't just buy Chromebooks, but I get the logic of it. It seems that they're trying to compete with the Surface and the iPad, really, and they have to have some skin in that game, even if it's not going to be massively successful for them. They have to at least have a go. But you have to ask yourself, how many times are we going to see companies attempt to put a desktop UI on top of Android and have it not sell very well. We'll watch them do it right up until the release of Fuchsia. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, while we're talking about embedded devices, on the other end is all of those home routers. And our favorite project to make those just a little bit better is OpenWRT, and they've got a new release, which is a major milestone. 1806 has come out, and this is the first release since they merged back with LEED or LEDE. And it's been a year in the making. And there is definitely some results of that year of work. So depending on your architecture, you're either going to get kernel 4.9 or 414, which is pretty recent. There's also been nice improvements to the system upgrade procedures and a new auto rollback functionality to revert the configuration changes when access to the router is lost. As well, of course, a bunch of other features, security improvements, and WireGuard VPN optimizations. 
And WireGuard's something that might well be in the kernel pretty soon. I hope so. WireGuard is some good tech. If you're not familiar, it's a secure network tunnel written from the ground up for Linux. It's been around for three years of serious development. It's in deployment at large corporations. And it's been designed with the primary goal of being both easy to audit by virtue of being small and highly secure from a cryptography systems and security perspective. Yeah, it's been an out-of-tree module for quite a while, and it's been pretty widely deployed in data centers and whatnot. So it's no surprise, really, that this is happening, but it is definitely good news. Yeah, and, you know, as the very nature of being an out-of-tree module, it had its own Git repo and its own mailing list, so you could really specifically watch the development of WireGuard for a while. And they've been testing the WireGuard module against every stable Linux kernel since 3.10, on a variety of architectures. So this is about as baked as it gets before something goes in the kernel. And that might be uh, why Linus seems to love it so much. He says, on an unrelated note, I see Jason actually made the pull request to have WireGuard included in the kernel. And then Linus goes on to say, can I just once again state my love for it and I hope it gets merged soon? Maybe the code isn't perfect, but I've skimmed it and compared to the horrors that are open VPN and IPsec, and it's a work of art. Yeah, glowing praise from Linus there. But I didn't think OpenVPN was that bad. It's the kind of go-to for a lot of people. you got to think about it, though, from the kernel perspective. These are guys that are writing the Linux kernel, and WireGuard has been created specifically for Linux's kernel, Linux's networking stack, and all of that. And so OpenVPN and IPsec, while great, are not purpose-built for Linux. They're a general-purpose technology. They work on the BSDs, they work on the Windows, they work on the Macs. And so it's not like, custom engineered for all of the particulars of Linux's kernel. And I think when you look at it from that perspective, they just think it's this is this is a work of art because it's just it beautifully plugs in with all the stuff they've been building for years. And another great thing about WireGuard is the code's been audited by a couple of academic institutions and those audits are being verified at the moment. So we pretty much know that it is rock solid. Last.ting.com. Ting is smarter than unlimited wireless because if you just use less, you pay less. The average Ting bill is $23 per phone per month. It's pay for what you use, a fair price for however much you talk, text, and data you use. But perhaps my favorite part, no contracts, nor the termination fees, no quote, unquote, service agreements. And they've got nationwide coverage. Rest assured, they've got you covered with coast-to-coast CDMA and GSM coverage. So what's ever better in your area or whatever device that you might have, which also means if you bring a device to Ting, CDMA or GSM, they'll give you $25 in service credit instead of taking it off a phone. And it'll probably pay for more than your first month. they got a bunch of great devices. They have a great control panel to manage your wireless account. I've been using Ting for over four years. I've also got two Ting MiFi's that I have sitting in my RV ready to go whenever we hit the road. It's $6 a month for each, plus Uncle Sam's cut. It's not a big deal to have that as an available option, and then I get two networks worth of coverage. It's a super great way to do wireless. It's smarter than unlimited. If you use less, you pay less. Last.ting.com. It's been a pretty good week for FOSS projects in terms of donations. Let's start with Elementary OS. They've had a large anonymous donation, and that has allowed Cassidy to go full-time with the project, joining Daniel there. So now they've got two full-time staffers. That's got to be good news for them. Yeah, and Cassidy comes from System76, where I believe he's worked since 2014. In 2017, he was officially promoted to the UX architect for System76 hardware software and tools, and of course, everyone's favorite, Pop! OS. This is a big move, and congratulations to Cassidy. And he says, the continued support for our community, as well as a large private contribution, has given me the opportunity to go full-time and do this as my career. Now, here's the key part I took away from his blog post, which we'll have linked in the show notes. I plan to continue to focus on the areas I've been working on as a volunteer, plus dedicate time to working with OEMs, app developers, and other parties to help keep elementary financially sustainable. So there's a lot in this paragraph, so I wanted to pull out a couple of details. Let's start with the last one. Keep elementary financially sustainable. This is, right now at least, a one-time donation. So this will give Cassidy about a year's runway, but they will have to come up with other ways to fund that work after this year. So that's the financially sustainable part there, and I think that's interesting. But then this other line in here, dedicate time to working with OEMs, 
Well, now that's interesting, considering that Cassidy had been at System 76 since 2014. He may have a very good perspective on how to work with OEMs and how a distribution can work with OEMs. There's also a bit of talk at the end of this post about continuing their relationship with System 76 just from the other side now. You take these two elements together, I'm just saying Cassidy could be like an OEM ninja for elementary OS here and could create some great deals and have really good insights into how these companies actually function. Well, let's hope so, because we've seen a fair few smaller projects struggling financially lately. And there are definitely OEMs out there looking to put distros like elementary on hardware because they've proven to sell pretty well. Really, the name of the week, though, is Handshake.org. They're a decentralized certificate authority and a peer-to-peer DNS service. The Gnome Foundation has received $400,000 from them, as well as Apache, the EFF, and other projects have received some funds. And the way the money breaks down for Gnome is $300,000 goes to the project and $100,000 goes to GIMP. That is massive, given there are so few people working on GIMP. That's going to be a lot of money for them. But what do you make of Handshake.org, then? Is this um, revolutionary, or is it just yet another sort of ICO-based scam? I don't know if a scam is the right way to put it. Maybe an ICO hopeful. <laughs> I mean, Handshake, in, in a, in a, at least in theory, is a, is a great idea. Decentralized, permissionless, naming protocol that's compatible with DNS, where every peer is validating and in charge of managing the root zone with the goal of creating alternatives to existing certificate authorities. I can tell you that's something the internet desperately needs. And they're really not trying to replace DNS, but to replace the root zone file and the root servers with this handshake system. And I think that's a pretty clever idea. I don't know if it's possible, but it's clever. This sounds like ideal tech snap material to me. Maybe you and Wes could uh, go into this in a bit more depth. Hmm, perhaps. Well, let's keep the decentralized train running here because Mozilla would like us all to talk about the D-Web. Yeah, the decentralized or distributed web. And this is a post on the hacks.mozilla.org blog. And it's a little bit light on content. It's more kind of queuing up what they're going to be talking about in a series of blog posts. But it really does raise a lot of the issues that centralization have caused. And hopefully this is going to offer some solutions to that, um, kind of spotlighting various projects that are aiming to avoid this centralization problem. And they're going for the hard kind of centralization. I mean, social networking and that kind of stuff is is going to be in this series, it sounds like. But they also want to try going after things like the DNS system and also certificate authorities, try to decentralize those aspects of the web. So they say, in a series of posts, they'll introduce projects that cover social communication, online identity, file sharing, new economic models, as well as high-level application platforms. All of this work will either be decentralized or distributed, minimizing or entirely removing central control. Now, the whole post has more, including diagrams about the differences between centralized, decentralized, and distributed. So you might want to give it a read if this is an area that kind of gets you excited. LinuxActionNews.com slash 65. But it's not the only thing that Mozilla have been up to this week. They've also announced evolving the Firefox brand and talking about how they've got two possibilities for the visual branding of Firefox. And they're not asking people to vote. They're kind of asking for opinions, but they're saying that's not necessarily going to influence their decisions. And they're two quite distinct visual styles. And I must say, I prefer the second one. I thought you might. Yeah, it's much more traditional. And I kind of like the first one. They call them System (laughs) 1 and System (laughs) 2. And I kind of just like, if you're going to change it, go for something bold. But the origins of this whole redesign makes it sound like there may be some cool projects in the Mozilla Skunk Work Labs, they say a team made up of product and brand designers at Mozilla have begun imagining a new system to embrace all the Firefox products in the pipeline and those still in the minds of our emerging technologies group, a.k.a. the Skunk Works. If they want to be modern and hip, they have to kind of design these things, and I hate saying this, Joe, but it's true, with the app icon in mind. What's the icon look on the phone? And the System 1 design, I think, is much more distinctive. Is it distinctive, or does it look just like GitLab? Now I can't unsee that. (laughs) I saw them side by side, and it was unbelievable how close they were. you think they would have noticed that. Dang it, Joe. Dang it. Well, okay, let's talk about the tech side of Firefox for a bit, because version 63 is going to have a great new feature for Linux users. It will use a bit more RAM, though. 
Yeah, out-of-process extensions, which were available on the other platforms, Windows and Mac, are finally coming to Linux as the kind of second-class citizen. But, well, at least we're getting them now. Yeah, and this is really the fruits of a process that began three years ago with the move to web extensions. And that's what's making this possible. The only type of extensions that will be supported by Firefox 63 is web extensions. The addition of another running process will also increase your memory, but the way this is going to work is these extensions will be out of the main Firefox process and onto their own. So if they have some shenanigans, if they have a crash, they do not affect your main browser thread. It's similar to why Chrome uses so much memory, but Firefox thinks they may have done it a little more clever and a little slimmer. Well, you mentioned the extra RAM usage, and you do have to wonder, is this going to mean extra CPU overhead as well? And just generally, performance might suffer a little bit. But then performance versus stability, I'm always going to pick stability. I agree. The web browser has become such an essential part of my daily work that making it more stable is the first priority. Performance, though, is much appreciated. And that might be where we get long term. If you think about it, you're kind of getting Firefox down to a core now. And that makes it much easier to improve security and stability over the long term. And this work really goes all the way back to Firefox 49. It has taken a while for us Linux users to get this, but this has been something that has been done right, has been well-engineered, and it's a long-term work that isn't even necessarily done with this stage, but this might be one of the most significant stages of this work. Well, we'll be following that process over the next weeks and months and years, and you can too. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. You can support the whole network at our Patreon page, patreon.com slash jupitersignal. We'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on Linux and the open source news. I'm at Chris LAS. I'm at Joe Ressington. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next week. See you later. (laughs) 